Come on, how about that B-roll? So now the question is, when does B-roll become A-roll? Hello, and welcome back to B-roll and board games. I feel like it's been some time since I've seen you guys. Maybe it's because I've been stuck on a mountain for a few days or so, and time passes by 10 times slower there, but who knows? Anywho, today we are covering Vindication by Orange Nebula Games. If it's your first time here on B-roll and board games, I would love to have you on board. I have a couple new series planned. I have a new intro planned. You don't want to miss it. Um, and it would help me out a lot if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, as all YouTubers say. But still, we don't want you to miss our video, so that's why we say it. Now, on top of that, if you want to see more frequent updates, I do have an Instagram at Beetle and Board Games where I post all the board game pictures leading up to the series and to keep you guys updated on what I'm doing. Now, on top of that, I'm trying to get more into cinematic Insta stories, so that's exciting. And I would love to have you on board. So today we are covering Vindication by Orange Nebula Games. And the premise is you were thrown overboard after living a life of luxury and cruelty, and you're trying to basically redeem yourself. So you're thrown overboard and washed ashore on the island, hence the beetle sequence. But now you only have the breath of your lungs and the beating of your heart to survive on this island and redeem your corrupted past and regain as much honor as you can before the end of the epoch. So, let's set up the game. So the main board has two sides. Now we're gonna set up this game on the beginner side first, which is the side that has all of these labels versus the other side, which has no labels at all. So you wanna give each player these filled game trays and then they can choose a color. There's no difference in strategy between any of the colors, so just go ahead and choose whichever color you like. And then take out the character tile from the tray and put it next to your power board with the side that says guilt ridden scumbag facing up. And then take your journey cards. Side note, look how satisfying this game tray setup is. They even have like the symbols on the right to show you which deck of cards could wear. I mean, come on. On top of that, the player boards are so nice and satisfyingly thick. It's just, yeah. So the idea is you washed up on shore, right? So it'll tell you where exactly you washed up on shore. And on top of that, it'll tell you what you start with. So in this case, it's space 12 over here. And then it'll tell you to place your wooden scoring disc at space 15. Now next, you'll be revived by a traveler so it'll tell you to draw a type of companion card. And in this case, it's a red one that doesn't have the symbol shown over here. And then lastly, something inside you awakens. So now put eight blocks on your potential, eight blocks into your influence, and then two in conviction. And then one into each of the attribute circles for inspiration, knowledge, and strength. Now next, you're gonna take all the card decks listed in the six bases of the board, shuffle them, and then place the top card to the right and the deck on the left of each color coded space, like the yellow companion deck, this is gonna go on the left here, and then draw a yellow companion card to put on the right side. And then you wanna shuffle the secret quest cards and then deal two to each player. They'll then take one to put face down and then return the other one to the stack. Now each player can always look at their own secret quest at any time. There are also 19 core region tiles. You're gonna put these into a cloth pouch and then reveal two regions adjacent to each player. Then just leave the pouch next to the board for now. After that, you're gonna go ahead and arrange the six mastery tiles on the lid of the community game tray. So these over here are the proficiency tiles for each color. Put one less proficiency tile than the number of players in a stack on the main board under the related attribute circle. So let's say you're playing in a three player game you're gonna use two tiles of each color, which makes it 12 total. Then in the community tray, take the four metal trigger tokens and put them on the 30, 45, 60, and 75 spaces. Doesn't matter which side is facing up. And the last part of the setup is to randomly flip two end game trigger cards face up next to the game board, and that's it. So now the fun begins. How do you play Vindication? Now first off, everyone's going to reveal the regions adjacent to your player token by drawing from the pouch. Whoever has the lowest number space gets the starting player mini called Sestra, the Lord Keeper, and then it goes clockwise from that player. Now we'll set up for a three player game in this case. Now on your turn, you have three main actions and five bonus actions. Let's talk about the main actions first. You can perform these actions in any order and can only perform them once. The first action is to move, which is the only action that you have to do each turn. The other two are optional. So now to move, you're only gonna move your player medallion across the connected triangles on the board. And since you start with two speed for now, you can for now move two spaces. So some things to keep note of, you have to move at least one space per turn and you cannot end on the same space that you started on. You can move into numbered spaces. 
And you can also move through other players, but you just can't stop on their space as a last turn. So let's say in a very rare case, you get stuck and all opponents block every one of your movements. You can then add up to two speed to your movement, but this is gonna make you dilute one power. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so you move two spaces, now what? Well now you're gonna draw one tile from the bag and then place it on each open hex that you've discovered in order. So if I move these two spaces, I'm gonna draw one tile for this space over here and then another tile for this one, that's it. So now that you discovered new regions, the second action makes sense because now you can visit the regions that you just discovered. Now on these tiles, the two at the bottom means that they're worth two honor at the end of the game if you still control it. And remember, the goal is to gain the most honor by the end of the game. On top, it'll either show you what you gain if you visit like the library here so lets you gain plus two knowledge, or it'll list a requirement before you gain something like visiting the command post requires three strength, but in turn, you can increase your speed for sacrificing the three strength that you just gave up. But of course, if you can't pay this cost then you can't visit that region just yet. And keep in mind that region actions can only be performed once per turn. If you don't wanna visit a region, you can also choose to rest, which will let you augment one power. Again, we'll talk about power in just a quick second. Some regions will also give you cards like the Ancient Tomb lets you gain a trait by using two wisdom. To get a card though, you'll choose from the face up one or you can draw one from the face down stack. If you pick the face up one, just take the top card of the deck and replace it. And if there's no face up card, just reveal it from the stack and then go from there. Lastly, if an effect somehow causes you to have more than one face up card, all you have to do is take the top card that's available and then the bottom one will be available after the top card. You don't have to flip any new cards in this case. If you want more control of your destiny, you can take an empowered draw by using one conviction. Okay, I know, I know, you're like, what's power, what's conviction? You keep using these terms, but you're not defining what it is. Just give me a second. We're weaving a story together. Is that how you weave? Weaving a story together, just hold on one second. So if you use one conviction, you can draw the top three cards from the face down stack and then all face up cards and take your choice of any one card. After that, put the rest into the stack, even the ones that were originally faced up, and then flip a new face up card to replace any of the previous ones. Now for secret quests, there are no face up cards, so just shuffle everything back. And then for the pet menagerie, just shuffle all these back too and flip three new face up cards to make a brand new market. I'll reiterate the pet menagerie in the expansion, but just so you know for now. Now the last thing on cards is whenever you get a card, you lose or gain honor right away. So if you lose or abandon a card, it gets removed from the game and then you automatically lose the positive honor listed on the card, but the reverse doesn't hold true. So if you abandon the card that has negative honor, you don't gain that honor back. That's super illegal. So you have to move at least one space per turn and speed dictates how many triangles you can move. Then as you reveal locations from moving, you can visit it to gain different attributes or you can rest to augment power. And sometimes it'll also let you gain cards or use the empowered draw leading to the third action, which is activating those cards. All you have to do is take one block on your influence sphere and then put it on the character or companion that you control. And then you gain those listed attributes up to what's listed. So for example, here we have the beast mistress Veroa, which gives you up to two strength. So you can choose to gain zero, one, or two strength. Let's finally talk about the power board. So you have three spheres listed here. The one on the very left is your potential. So this sphere lets you increase the number of blocks that you can use in the game but you have to augment these blocks by resting or by visiting monastery. All that means is to move the cubes one level up, going from potential to influence and from influence to conviction. That's augmenting. So in turn, the middle sphere with influence, this is your main resource in the game. So this is the resource that you can move from here to the board to track your attributes or to your companions and so on. So just think of conviction as a stronger resource. It lets you gain control of regions, it stops champions from being killed by monsters, or even using the empowered draw that I talked about earlier. So augment means to move these cubes up. Diluting is the opposite, so it'll make them move down. And then every time a block gets returned to your board, they automatically go to the influence sphere. Now let's talk about controlling regions. To control a region, you have to visit a region, and then you immediately gain two honor when taking control of it, and two honor at the end of the game for each region that you still control. Now as long as you control the region, you'll also gain two honor each time a player visits that region, but you can't gain honor yourself by visiting your own controlled region. You also can't gain control of one region and then visit another region all in the same turn. If you want to gain control of a region, you have to visit that region and then use one conviction cube to put it on that region. If you want to take control of another player's region, you have to use two cubes. And if you're the player that loses that region, nothing happens really other than your cube returning back to your, as you guessed it, influence sphere. 
Uh, next up, let's talk about the row of cards starting with the three companions. You can find them at the inns and the you can find them at the inns and there are yellow, blue, and red companions. Yellow gives you two inspiration, blue gives you two knowledge, and red gives you two strength. So when you visit an inn, you just have to sacrifice you just have to sacrifice one of these attributes and then gain the corresponding colored companion. There are no limits to the number of companions that you can have in your party, and you can also repeatedly activate them. Let's go over a couple more regions. The Ancient Tombs is the only map in the game where you can gain traits which are basically passive or triggered abilities. So same idea as the other regions. You have to be adjacent to Ancient Tombs, you have to use two wisdom to attain a trait, and then since you're gaining a card, you can draw the face up trait or the face down trait, and as soon as you get the trait, you also gain honor. Now traits that have triggered abilities can be used more than once per turn, and passive traits are ones that can be used on another player's turn, and those can only be used once per turn. So you're starting to get the trend, right? We're looking at these region tiles, and there's no limit to the amount that you can control. You sacrifice attributes to get them, and sometimes they'll give you cards which you pick from the face down stack or from the face up stack. And in turn, you'll gain honor and then abilities for certain traits or special abilities for companions and so forth. <sighs> now in turn, these regions that you control by the end of the game are gonna count towards a specific mastery depending on what color they are. Now next are relics. So same idea here, you're gonna pay a cost, gain honor, and then gain an ability. Relics are different in that you have to use influence in order to use them, max being once per turn. Now the monsters are up next, and what you have to do here is use two courage to defeat a monster, and you're always gonna win as long as you have a champion. The champion is a companion with the lowest number in your party. Now here is where the dice come into play. The black die is gonna tell you what you lose, so this side is fatigue, where you have to add two influence to your champion. This side over here is death, where your champion loses honor. The black face is a miss, which means you evade the creature's attack, and the white die will tell you what you learned during the fight, aka you're going to gain that attribute immediately. Okay, let's say you're tired of moving only two spaces and you want to travel further across the map. Here's where speed comes into play, by visiting a command post. Now you're going to sacrifice through strength here, but in turn you'll be able to increase speed, and every time you upgrade, you're going to take and flip the next high speed tile and gain that honor right away based on whatever is listed on the card. Now a couple more things to go over before the end game. In the base game, you'll have one secret quest card to pursue during the game if you want to, and the main benefit of secret quests is that your opponents won't know if you completed it or not, so they won't know where your total honor is. And both quests are optional, so you won't lose any honor for any incomplete quests. And then finally, vindication itself. How do you vindicate yourself? Well, there are two criteria. One, you have to make sure all your potential is moved over to your influence sphere. And then secondly, you have to make sure that your player marker also passes or reaches 25 honor. Once you meet both of those things, that's when you can flip your character aura from the wretched side to the vindicated side, and you'll gain a one-time honor bonus and all these stat increases. On top of that, you stay vindicated even if you dilute influence box back into the potential sphere, or if you fall below 25 honor. But for these tiles, basically, once per turn, you can use your attributes in order to gain one proficiency tile. You just have to turn in three of any attribute in order to gain that tile, and this counts as two cards for its corresponding color which will then increase your end game mastery total for that attribute by two. You can also gain these tiles at any time during your turn as long as you have the attributes to turn in. You can also keep gaining them as long as tiles are available, but it is limited to once per turn. And you can discard these at any time in order to gain two of that attribute, but if you do that, it does get removed from the game. So we've been talking a lot about attributes throughout the whole video, but what exactly does it mean? Let's go ahead and clarify that right now. So every attribute is like a specialized influence. So when you study the library, your influence then moves from your influence sphere to the knowledge sphere on the main board. And then if you use that knowledge, it goes back to the influence sphere. So there are six attributes total with inspiration, strength, and knowledge being the common attributes. And then the other three are the heroic attributes. So now you can also convert the common attributes to the heroic attributes. So one inspiration and one strength together makes one courage. One strength and one knowledge equals one vision. And then one knowledge plus one inspiration will net you one wisdom. You can convert attributes at any time and however many times you want because it is a bonus action. Now here we are at endgame. So how does the game end? So remember in the beginning, we flipped two trigger cards face up. Now once a player meets one of those conditions, the next round will be the final round. So when a player advances to these trigger tokens on the scoring track that we set up on 30, 45, 60, and 75, they go ahead and take the token and then a brand new trigger is added to the two active ones. 
Now, as soon as one or more of these endgame trigger cards are met, take out any trigger tokens remaining on the track. You're going to finish the current round, and then the next round will be your last round. And then award honor for mastery tiles, any kind of endgame bonuses like for monsters or secret quests, and two honor for every region that you control. Now the player with the most honor wins, and if there's a tie, there are three tiebreakers determined in this specific order. First, it's the player with the most conviction. Second, it's the player with the least amount of potential. And third, it'll be the player with the least amount of endgame trigger tokens. Now let's recap. On your turn, you can do three things. You have to move at least once and according to your speed, which is two at the beginning, and then reveal any open hex regions that you passed by in the order that you moved in. The second thing is you can visit an adjacent region on a map or you can rest in order to augment one power. And number three, you can activate by moving one influence to a companion and then gaining those attributes or abilities. The five bonus actions were to one, control a region by using one conviction, or two conviction if you're overtaking another player's region. The second bonus action was to gain a proficiency tile once per turn. The third was to vindicate yourself if you have augmented all of your potential and if you reached or passed 25 honor. The fourth bonus action was to recover influence, meaning you can recover a block of your influence anywhere in the game except from your potential. <clears throat> and dilute power from vindication to influence, but if you recover influence from a companion, then all that influence gets returned and that card is removed from the game. But on top of that, you also lose that companion's honor. And the last bonus action is to convert your two common attributes to one heroic attribute. Endgame is triggered once a player meets one of the endgame trigger cards where you'll finish the current round, have one last round, and then total up all of your honor. So that was the base game of Vindication. There are also a ton of expansions. Are we going to talk about it today? Yes, we are. We're going to cover every single expansion right now. Now, just keep in mind before you start that when you want to include these in the game, just follow the formula listed on page 34 of the rulebook on how to swap one or two tiles, etc. The first expansion is the 15 card treasury expansion. All you do here with these cards is you pretty much just shuffle them back into their card stacks with matching backs after all players have completed their journey cards at the start of the game. Now these cards make you lose honor once you get them, but in exchange, you want to get closer to other players because if you look at their abilities, it's going to disrupt other players close to you. But since they are in their own category, they don't give you any mastery at the end, nor do you gain or lose honor when losing a treacherous companion. Now for the next couple expansions, I want to explain them. So there is a formula on page 34 of your rulebook of how to swap tiles according to specific formula. But for expansion number two on the Jewel Crafter expansion, these include three tiles, one Jewel Crafter tile and two crystal mines. Now when you visit the crystal mines, you're gonna gain one crystal and one more crystal for each mine that you control. And one crystal pays off a companion and returns two influence from that companion back to your influence sphere. On top of that, you can also turn in three crystals at a time in order to gain two honor and three attributes of the same type. And then lastly, you can also turn in three attributes of the same type plus one crystal in order to make an infused crystal. And you can also turn in a combination of three attributes of the same type and one crystal in order to make an infused crystal or gemstone. Now these are permanent attributes that you can use. So let's say you want to defeat a monster using one courage from the board. Now you can use this courage infused crystal instead. So now nothing is lost. Okay. Number three is the exotic pet menagerie. So there's just one tile here and we have to set up a market by flipping three pets face up. This is the pet market. So when you visit the menagerie, you have to use one inspiration, one knowledge, and one strength, and then you can choose one of these pets or as per use, draw the top face down card. Pets attach permanently to your companions and some pet abilities will activate when you activate their master or some are passive so they'll be active as long as both the pet and the master are in your party. You can move pets to a brand new master by adding one influence to the new master, and you can do this any number of times with any number of pets. So, But if you lose control of a pet's master, or if it's killed by a monster, you can move the pet to another companion, or if there are no companions, you can also assign it to yourself temporarily, but you can't use his abilities until you get a brand new companion. And lastly, if you abandon a pet's master, you also abandon the pet, so you'll lose honor from both. The Sacred Stones Expansion. When you visit the Sacred Stones, you can teleport to any space adjacent to either Sacred Stones region, and then you can take your normal movement right after that. So what's even cooler is if you're adjacent to the Sacred Stones and you control both, then you can also teleport anywhere on the map and then take your normal movement. The fifth expansion is the Temple Ruins. Now here you're going to draw two secret quests and keep one of them, and then shuffle the other one back into the stack. 
Uh, there's no limit to the number of secret quests that you can accept, and there is no penalty for any incomplete quest cards. Number six is the Well of Wishes expansion. So here you have 15 wish tokens that you turn to the side that shows the wishing wells, and then randomly flip three of these tokens over, and then place them on the Well of Wishes region tile. So when you visit this region, you can pick one of the three tokens and then immediately gain the listed attributes or honor. And then after that, randomize this token back into the pool and then place a brand new token back. So there's always gonna be three tokens there. Now number seven is the building site expansion. So for this expansion, these building sites are going to replace your visit action. They basically reveal the opportunity to build a region and then that replaces your visit action. So at the start of the game, pick the expansion tiles that you wanna make available. Now for example, we can put these four face up and then these four building sites will go in the cloth bag. So if you draw one of these sites, it's placed normally and then the player can use one conviction in order to pick one of these region tiles and then build it at that spot. Now this gives them control and honor right away. If they don't build though, another player is free to use their map action on their turn in order to build there. The eighth expansion is the Guilds and Monuments expansion. Now this one is a bigger expansion, so after you set up the game, each player takes one of these expansion boards that match their color. There's no difference between them other than color. So this expansion gives you a fourth action each turn, which is placing your Guild Favorite token, which makes a region fortified. So you can put your Guild Favorite token on a region that you control, and then flipping this to the fortified side, and they're special because they can't be controlled by another player for the whole game, even after your Guild Favorite token has been removed. And by the way, these metal versions were from Kickstarter, but the base game will have these colored ones. But yeah, you can use these on the opponent's tile, which means until your next turn, if you or any other player visits this tile, you split the honor. One will be for you, and one will be for the visiting player. Now the third spot you can put this token on is in a barricade, which is basically an open space, letting you gain two honor whenever an opponent lands on or passes through this space. Now there's also a slot for these on your power board, which will let you augment one block from potential to influence, or from influence to conviction. Now, this even protects you against treachery, so if another player's actions will cause you to dilute one power from conviction to influence, the guild favorite token will also block that. Now, if you put these on your companion, it'll let you gain one influence to your pool when activated instead of adding from your influence sphere. On a relic, you can add one charge instead of returning one influence back. On a trait, it lets you gain one honor whenever it's used or triggered. On a monster that you defeated, you can roll the die twice instead of once and then choose between those results. And then lastly, you can put it on your monument so you can contribute any number of proficiencies and attributes in order to reconstruct the guild monument. Now if you fill up all these slots, make sure the proficiencies used here are not the same and you also get 15 honor and then after that you return everything back to their original locations. Now in the Myths and Wonders expansion, you're going to put the expansion board right next to the main board and then match the number of players face up. And then take out either the Academy Region tile or the inn, and then place Ronak in the middle with six treachery blocks on the triangle surrounding it. Now the point of this expansion is to provoke Ronak until Tuk Tuk, Tuk Tuk, Tuk Tuk comes and saves the day. So you play the game as normal, except if you end your movement on an intersection with the treachery block, move it on to the Ronak tile. So as soon as all six blocks are removed, he emerges and now you put the mini on his region tile. Now whoever triggered Ronak can finish a turn, now from there, a sub game begins, so all players remain stationary until the whole event is complete. So this is how the event works. Whoever would be the next person will take Cestra. Now take one of the black cubes and put that on your companion with the lowest initiative. Now this makes it your champion, and play begins clockwise from there. So now you start fighting Ronak each turn, and you generate attributes by activating one of your companions or your character. Keep in mind that you cannot recover influence from the Myths and Wonders board. Now even if generating attributes and contributing attributes are optional actions, you can't move or visit regions until Ronak is defeated. So to contribute an attribute to the battle, move one attribute from the main board or conviction from your power board onto the Myths and Wonders board in any sphere you want. And then you gain whatever's listed. Now this symbol lets you return two influence from companions to your power board, and this symbol lets you augment one potential to influence. This third symbol lets you augment influence to conviction, and this arrow symbol lets you do a one-time teleport to any occupied space. The loot bag lets you pick first once this event is over, but it's only for four to five player games. And this symbol lets you clone an effect that's no longer available in the attribute rings. So if both teleport token spheres were taken in strength, you can also contribute to the upper left sphere in the wisdom ring in order to gain a teleport token. Okay, so generate an attribute, contribute it, and then roll dice regardless of whether or not you participated in the battle. 
So roll and then you gain the attribute on the white die and suffer the consequences from the black die. So if your champion dies from this, the companion in your next party with the next lowest initiative will become your new champion. And if all your champions are killed, then you have to skip turns until Ronak is defeated. Now remember, you can use Conviction in order to prevent the death of a champion. And if everyone dies, then Ronak wins and the whole event will reset. So all of the blocks will go back to each player and the treachery blocks will also go back to the middle. Now if he's defeated, that's when you can flip the tile over and then you can put Tuk Tuk in replace of him. If you visit Tuk Tuk in the game, so now if you visit Tuk Tuk, you gain any one attribute that you don't already have. Now after defeating Ronak, you also flip loot cards face up two more than the number of players. It goes first to the player that has the loot token in the four or five player game, and then to the player with the highest initiative companion, and so on. After everyone gets one loot, these cards will go back and the main game continues. Now in the latest and greatest Leaders and Alliances expansion, which was on Kickstarter, this is going to add a bunch of new player options and player abilities. Okay. So to set up, you're going to place all of these six guild leaderboards out in a row. Everyone's going to take three triangular wooden rapport markers of their color and then place them in their personal supply. The white rapport threshold token goes on space 20. So how this works is when your scoring token reaches the rapport threshold by gaining honor, which is the number spaces shown here, then they've unlocked the ability to gain rapport with the guild leaders. You're going to take one rapport marker and put it on the top numberless space on the track of the guild leader just like this. Now players can gain rapport with any guild leader they want to, but they start with their own guild color first. So to gain rapport, as you can guess, you're going to contribute attributes by returning them back to your sphere. You gain one rapport for each inspiration, knowledge, or strength, and two for the remaining heroic attributes. Now that's how you gain rapport, but you can use that rapport in order to gain guild perks depending on how much you have, and you can only do this once per turn. Now all you do if you want to use perks is you just move your rapport down a number of spaces depending on what you're trying to use. So you can also initiate an alliance once per game, and to do this, you're going to gain honor equal to the numbered spaces right underneath your rapport markers on the two different leaderboards. And then you're going to move the rapport markers onto open alliance spaces above the guild leader portraits on those boards. And then, now all laid out here are the six guild leaders with every one of the guild perks. So we'll show this in a three-turn example. Let's say it's my turn, and I want to gain rapport with Xan. But yeah, let's say I want to gain rapport with Xan by using two knowledge. And then I'm also going to use two strength and one vision in order to gain four more since vision is a heroic attribute and counts as two. On my next turn, I could initiate an alliance between these two guilds and gain 17 honor, because I have my Order of the Folded Leaf marker on the 10th spot and the blue marker on the 7th spot. But instead, I want to use both guild perks from El Gishar, bringing this marker down to 3. Now that's turn 2, and then on my third turn, now I want to initiate an alliance, so I'll go ahead and move my marker to the top spot here, which locks alliances for the game, and it also gives me 3 honor for the Order of the Folded Leaf. Now that's also going to go top as well, and now it will score me 7 honor. Another part of this expansion are the three new regions. The Chrono Gate, which lets you dilute three conviction into potential. The Chrono Gate lets you dilute three conviction to potential, so you can have an extra turn. The Inn of the White Raven, which lets you retire any number of companions in exchange for three honor for every retired companion. And an alternate art for the Academy if your Academy tile was missing the two honor symbol. Now the last part of this expansion is the play variant rules, which can be added onto the guilds and monuments expansion that I did talk about earlier. Now all these cool minis can be added on to the game if you want to tack on these play variant rules. So it starts when you constructed a monument, and then you can place the monument on any region that you control, giving you the esteemed guild status. Now no other player can control that region once you place it, and now that region, along with all adjacent regions, will now grant you double honor when visited by other players by the end of the game. So let's say I put a monument on the fort. Every time another player comes and visits this fort, the Ancient Tomb, or the Inn, all of which I control with the Monument, then now I'm going to gain 4 Honor instead of 2, and at the end, I'll also score 12 Honor for all these map regions instead of 6. However, the Monument that I constructed has no effect on the rest of the regions in this circle, or the regions outside of that circle. And now the Kickstarter version that I got also came with the special 12 card community pack. Shall we open it on this channel? Of course we are. And now it's time to open the booster pack. I think this is exclusive, or if not, at least it was a community pack, but... Alright. 
awesome. I actually love it when I tear booster packs like that. It's great. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, I haven't opened a booster pack for so long. This is actually really exciting. Bam! So, first off, we get Ro the Illuminated, which is... We get Ro the Illuminated, Vetra the Shadow Stepper, Braga the Tactical, Tensho of the Warded Way, Dreams of Daedalus, Gruul of the Muck, the Lurking Herd, Area the Wing Chime, oh this looks pretty cool, Agios the Wandering Guardian, Nico the Playful, Grit, Benevolence, and I think that's it, right? So a bunch of brand new cards, two trade cards, two three pet cards, two monsters, one relic, one companion, or actually one, sorry, one uh, purple companion, one yellow companion, one red companion, one blue, actually two yellow companions, if we categorize those together. Sorry, I'm out of frame. Okay. And that was Vindication. I hope you liked it. I hope you liked the way I explained things and hopefully it's super clear to you. Now, if it was, again, I would love to have your support for this channel by subscribing to Be On Board Games. I cannot wait to share some exciting new series with you all. But until next time, I love it.